Welcome to the Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bone. Well, here we are at the Pima Air and Space Museum, and I'm not alone because we have the fabulous Joe Welding hiding down there as well. Um, and this is sticking to my face for some reason, because we've got something special. The lovely team here at the Pima Air and Space Museum are going to be letting us climb around this, which is the fabulous B-52A, high and mighty. This is, if we can actually see through the sunlight, the X-15 dropship. So you can see all the markings on the side. This aircraft was still being repainted while we were here last time, but they have done an absolutely wonderful job. We'll do a bit of a walk around, but the important thing is gonna be for me and Joe to get inside. And I'm gonna force Joe to go in first and follow him it. up. So they very kindly opened the hatch and let's go swelter for a few minutes. Want me to clear the rattlesnakes for you? Yes, please. We're, we're, we're not joking about those things. Okay, so let the camera adjust and up we come. So this is one of the few actual production B-52As. We'll go down there in a bit. But this one spent its whole life with NASA and doing all the vital things of the X-15 program. Here at Edwards Air Force Base, September 17, 1959 is a historic date. Early on this Thursday morning, the B-52 carrier takes the X-15 out for its maiden powered flight. Hydraulic capture, Scott. Minus two, and holding since we passed the tower. Test pilot Scott Crossfield is buckled in and ready for a ride to 40,000 feet, where he'll be cut loose for the first demonstration of this plane's abilities and performance. If I straddle that, you can see he's got none of the upgrades you see in the others, so this is the ejection procedure, yeah, because that your seat goes straight out the bottom. Straight down. All the windows are painted up to try to keep some of the warmth out. It's not too bad, actually. Yeah. Considering how warm it is today. But on here we've got tech manual. Yeah, Revision. Ma maintenance instructions. Yeah, Revision 003. Keeping that going. So, here we are. So what am I guessing? Flight engineer station? Yeah, I would guess so. Because we'd have the two other seats behind us for nav and bombardier and stuff. He says, thinking back to, <laughs> thinking back to um, Dr. Strangelove, which is my sort of. I think that, so I've been on a B-52 before. I think that seat was originally the bombardier seat, if okay. I remember right. Obviously not for this airplane. No. But. Oh, what have we got down here? Oh, what's we got? Oh, we've got chocks. And all the relays. Rabbits foreign of things. Right, let's head up. Now it's starting to get warm. We'll come to the cockpit in a minute. So this is all the umbilicals and equipment for the X-15. So when we get over here, you're going to be able to see that the switch gear is all modified for it and for the most part if you shine your light on the little gauge there on the middle you can see it's not exactly high-tech with the old dyno rider bits and pieces on it if you want to swap me here i think we've got fuel transfer controls to the to the X-15, yeah, look, it's yeah. X-15 locks level. Oh yeah, look at that. Okay, there you go, as you're there, do you wanna? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get in close? That's so, fantastic. Uh, system diagram of the uh, oxidizer and fuel tank. And I think if I remember right, they used fuel tanks in the bomb bay yep. of this airplane and then transferred them to the vehicle once the airplane was in flight. Yep, that, that so rings true. This would be the systems operator that was controlling all of that. And of course you had the uh, the poor pilot 
strapped in for the whole ride, no climbing out and right. doing that. Um, was it Cross Crossfield? It was strapped in one I always used to talk about it being a very unnerving experience. <laughs> you can only imagine. Yeah. So, and just in case we're not sure, it does still have a little label saying it's yeah. it's NASA. <laughs> They're all over the place. <laughs> this is ours, don't touch it. But it's, yeah, reasonably rudimentary additions to the aircraft. They're not going absolutely mad. And then, well, this one's got a, an above escape hatch. Yeah. For the ejection yeah. seat. So then we got, it's, Oh, so that's all the, the breakers for the X-15 over there yeah, as well. Yeah, I think it looks like this whole um, instrumentation setup was for the X-15. Yeah, so television, X-15, heater, miscellaneous, which is always handy. Launch operator. Yeah. That is something. Again, just next to no room. And we've got window here, which would look straight out onto the aircraft in its sling behind us here. Just thinking where the, as it, as a sort of domed, domed element. There we go, I grabbed that. We got yeah. down, another little panel down here, which is auxiliary locks top off for the main tanks and the drop tanks. Again, helpfully, Hopefully labelled by NASA, just in case someone fancied having it away. No, I don't become it right. Let's start moving ourselves over here. But yeah, it's it's all sort of ancillary systems that will just be on the umbilical to the the X-15, and we'll show the coupler when we get outside again on the aircraft itself. Right, let's not fall down the... down there. Get up to the business end. Pressure suit information. And then the cockpit. Which is, seriously, B-52A. There is nothing in here beyond dials and switches. What I might do to let my my chum in behind me. Let's just lean over here. Because down here is the launch switch. On off. Label NASA once again. Yep. Just to know it's theirs. And only one on the captain's side. That start selectors over there. Good old Boeing control column, which I don't think changed for God knows how long. But there we are. So launch control main box down there. So there's the master arming switch up in there. with the breakers. So here's a unique feature to the B-52. Many people know about the uh, landing gear that could be crabbed for crosswind landing. So this is the control for that. I don't know of any other aircraft that has that. There probably mm. are, but. There we go. It took out all the landing landing lights at Milton Hall for this year, didn't it? When it was doing the yeah, crab. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So what else we have in here? So this is pretty cool. So it's a X15 system. So this is the the lights. We'll have three red, an armed, and a green, which will be good for launch. Pilot going down here to confirm the drop. I'm assuming it would have done from there, or is that just arming the system? Master arming. I thought the guy in the back would have done it. I don't know. Mm. We'll have to ask the guys when we get back. But yeah, so. Your myriad throttle quadrant. <laughs> engine, engine controls. A lot of engine gauges up there. Air brakes, throttle braking. Sorry, off you go, grab your snaps. Oh, you're good. Yeah, it's 
it's as you would as you would expect for an aircraft of this age with just some really really cool additions thrown in but if you ever wondered what a <laughs> one of these aircraft looks like painted up on the inside now you know uh, what do we have up here so radios mode mode uh, IFF I'm guessing normal standby off emergency lighting consoles I'm trying not to get the glare from the lights coming in so dear viewer you may be stuck with that but yeah just so many engine engine gauges so there's left and right side white line demarcating it oil pressure along the top and then there we go that's quite interesting so there is the malfunction codes for Edwards so frequency was 284.1 code 1 all okay code 2 comms problems and then working your way down flight control would be a code 9 make everything everybody aware we've all seen the right stuff so we know what happens when somebody calls one of those codes oxygen yeah Look, look, look over your left shoulder and check out the array of circuit breakers back there. <laughs> so, and e equal number on this side as well. Very yep. complex airplane. Yeah, we've got water injection breakers down here as well. What do we have here? Uh, control surface power, main gear power, standby pumps. Right, I'll. There we go. I'll jump up so you can have a look over here, mate. <laughs> Try not to get too much of a shot of your ass. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think they used to have a B-52 logo on the uh, control column. Yeah. I bet somebody stole those at some point as a souvenir. Oh, 100%, yeah. Well, to be fair, it would have been us if nobody was looking. <laughs> <laughs> right, if we head down here. Did, did you see the ashtray? Oh, is that an ashtray? Oh, yeah. That's <laughs> brilliant. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, different time. Yeah, the jump seats, just a couple of bits of metal shoved together. All right, what do we have down here? Whew, it's warm. It's warm. Oh, there's a step there. And then there's the route back to the tail. Let's see how far we can get, I suppose. Yeah, I wonder if the uh, tanks are still in here. Let's go have a look. And dear Tom of 909, if you're watching, your t-shirts are going to be getting absolutely filthy. We're not going to get far, just to know if we all... So the forward wheel, um, wheel gear, uh, main gear bay. But all the piping's still here. There's the pumps for it over there as well. But yeah, I don't think we'll get very far that way, but you can give it a go. Backing out. Here's another one that's often asked about on long range aircraft. Hey! <laughs> if one is caught short, there you go. Not sure what the procedure for emptying that would be on this aircraft, but. Yeah. Somebody's going to be playing some jokes. Oop. Ouch. There's lots of things to catch yourself on. Bam. Safety, safety pin for the um, ejection, ejection system. Autopilot junction box just by your head. Nope. 
spare bulbs. There's a lot of stuff still in here, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah, it looks like, to me, very similar to what it would have been when the missions ended. And a lot of times, aircraft like this, all of the systems specifically related to the aircraft would be gutted. And obviously, it's not happened here. Bomb doors. Something. All four matter clear if it's frozen. Oh. Right, well, let's go have a look around the outside, and I'm sure we'll come back in to take more pictures. But the outside is just as interesting. It's also a hell of a lot cooler out here. So, there you go, High and Mighty One logo. Along the top, you've got all the missions, including the altitude records. So down here, you've got the 351,000 foot record. But then over here is where it all starts getting a bit interesting. So where we were looking back, you have TV control there, pointing back towards the aircraft. There's the, the dome we were having a, sticking our heads in for there. So. Yeah, realistically, we were only about as far down as here when we were inside. And uh, both of us being gentlemen of an age and stature, we were not going to climb down that tunnel. But this is a shoe for the X-15. And then all those cables and things basically attached to those two pickups in there. There's already a bird making a home in there. And then you have up in there, you'd have had the forward locking mechanism, fuel in here, more connections in there for electronics, blowout on there, and then there's just two, two pickups here. Yeah, those would be the big structural mounts. Yeah. So the two posts to fix it in each direction, and then those two hooks hold it vertically. And I guess they just come forward and release it. Yeah, it looks like they pivot. So yeah, it's a hole cut in the wing here for the tail. Yeah, you don't see that on many other B-52s. I don't know if it's coming out. There's the moon up there as well, but it's It is literally a time capsule, isn't it? It's just from crawling around in it. So look at the camera mounts here as well. So you can think about all that footage we've seen of the X-15 dropping off the aircraft were shot through those two windows right there. Yep. And a light. Oh yeah, because you can't film without proper, <laughs> proper lighting. C-130 just taking off behind us. Let's have a little gander up in here. So one of the things you'll see at the Pima Air and Space Museum, they try to be as sympathetic as possible, but people like pushing buttons. So they just quietly rivet up most of the attachments and things in it. So here's the rear. Main gear bay. wires and pulleys and hydraulic tubes and you've got the lower gearbox on the end on the the wheels for the aching crab yeah the actuators for that crabbing mechanism are up here so that knob we were seeing in the cockpit would control some valving that would basically move these two actuators differentially and turn these wheels and a kind of an interesting fact about this airplane. So this airplane was designed in the 50s before hydraulics were very reliable. So if we swing around here and look at the rudder for a second, 
An airplane this big traditionally would, or, or today would have a lot of hydraulics. Look at the size of the rudder. So that rudder is something like 10% core to the vertical tail. Traditionally, most airplanes are somewhere 30 to 40%. Mm -hmm. And so that is so, it's small like that, such that it could uh, reduce pilot forces because they didn't want to rely on unreliable hydraulics to power the flight controls. The problem with that is, is on a crosswind landing, you really need more rudder than that. So to alleviate that problem, they just said, well, we won't track correctly into the wind, we'll crab into the wind and just land in that direction. Hence the decision to pivot the, the wheels on the aircraft. So all that really comes back to is a, uh, due to the hydraulics, um, the unreliability of hydraulics in the 50s. And nowadays it's all hydraulics. <laughs> nowadays it's all hydraulics. <laughs> Systems have gotten way better and redundancy is better understood. And even more so, that rudder, you can notice there's a little, what looks like a trim tab on there. Yep. That's what the pilot is actually controlling with his feet. He's actually moving that trim tab. That trim tab moves the whole rudder. And that trim tab is about the same surface area you would have on a much smaller, you know, transport or a general aviation type aircraft. Hence, you're limited by how much force the pilot can put into his feet. Because this is a whole scale larger than, I suppose, B-36 aside, which we'll have to have a play with later. The elevator but, here is the exact same answer. Yeah. So very narrow cord elevator. And that tab there, that servo tab, is what the pilot's actually controlling with the control stick. I think later model B-52s did start to add more hydraulics, but these early ones for sure were um, able to be flown completely with, with just pilot forces, which is just amazing for an airplane this large and loads of vortices generated. Yeah, yep. So we've got them across the top surface of the wing down there. And then across the whole length of the, the tail. This would have had tail guns originally on this yeah. model, but they've been removed and fared over. And still has the fantastic wooden tail strike. Yeah. Inlet, inserts even. Now, dear viewer, you're going to see just how bright it is with the silver airplane reflecting. Well, they've done a lovely job. It's they photographed, beautiful. Yeah, they photographed all the markings on there before to make sure everything went back. Just the way it was. And a lot of effort has gone in to make sure that the uh, the orange is the right color, despite what a few people on the internet have said. It is correct because they've got the actual palettes from NASA. And then on this side, we've got some extra venting that you wouldn't normally see on a B-52 because just behind here are the fuel tanks. Yeah, my guess is those are for off, off venting the liquid oxygen tanks that would be in the bomb base. Yeah. With... It's probably, it's probably the inlet, isn't it? For... Up, it's... is quite something. Right, well, that's some of the fun. I suppose we have to stick our heads in the, the forward gear, don't we? So that walkway right here is the one we were seeing that we were, yeah, yeah. We're poking our heads into. So you can see why, dear viewer, if you're listening to this, sorry about this, but that walkway is not designed for <laughs> gentlemen of an age. <laughs> Even though dear Joe is in a far better state than I am. Yeah, I don't think that we'd, we'd make it too far down there. But I think it looks, that might just be the bulkhead, but there's definitely all the piping still for 
for the fuel tanks. I'll have to ask to see if the tanks are still in the base. I would have thought they would have been a pain in the ass to get out. Yeah, I'm pretty sure this piping is all from the original aircraft. This is the uh, ECS, or Environmental Control System. So it yeah. takes bleed air off of the engines. If you look right back here, I believe that is what's called an air cycle machine, which basically takes the hot air from the engines, repurposes it into compressing outside air, and there are some intercoolers somewhere, probably. I think right up there might be one of them, um, to basically get that cooler but pressurized air into the cabin for uh, breathing and just cabin pressurization. So I was, I was thinking of the, the ducting in here. Oh, yeah, that, from, yeah, from you're, yeah you're right. Yeah. Yep, yep, that, that the, does look the, like the it. Sil the, the silver wrappings on yeah. yeah. There we go. Goodness. And obviously, it would, it would be, see what happens in the desert. There's another bird making its home up in there. Keychain for anyone who can tell me whose nest that is, but there we go. All right, let's just get around the nose. Oops. And there you go. There's your walk around of 03. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bone and is a Bony Abroad podcast production. To learn more about our podcast and check out our previous episodes, head to www.thedamcasterspod.com.